everyone. Let me begin uh, by asking a simple question. So there is this image on the screen um, and it is just someone drew a random doodle or a sketch uh, on a computer. And if, if I ask uh, you all to sort of guess at what this is, uh, some of you might guess different things, but in general, a lot of us would uh, think of these as leafless trees in a deserted land. So these are tree branches and uh, there's just sort of, uh, they're put in some uh, deserted place. Uh, but this is what uh, the machine interprets them as, or, or an AI system that, uh, uh, an interactive AI art system that I built called Tandem back in 2016. This is what that art system interpreted this drawing as. So it, Things, I'm sure none of us or not many of us would have thought of these as dogs with large ears. And, but the machine thinks of them as that and has gone ahead and completed this, uh, this input into that with some sort of castles and, uh, and a car in the background and so on. So uh, this is what uh, excites me about AI art, this ability for the machine to now become part of the creative or imaginative process uh, in creation rather than the machine just being a simple tool to sort of make your lines more uh, smoother or things like that. Uh, so with that uh, context, whenever I say or talk about art, art being created by the machines, there's always this question, can computers be creative? Uh, and if the computers can be creative, uh, like we saw a little bit of that flavor in the last slide, then is that the end of the road for the human artists? Uh, to, to unpack uh, these questions, uh, uh, I'm gonna talk about this topic of data and technology, which I believe is the future of art. Um, and uh, thanks to the Ishania team at uh, IIT Guwahati, uh, my alma mater, uh, DOD, for inviting me to sort of present my thoughts on this topic. Uh, so uh, the three major themes that I think uh, AI art uh, enables us to think about is uh, to not look at uh, AI replacing humans uh, in any sense, but to look at how AI sort of augments humans uh, to create more than what they could otherwise do. So, in that example of, uh, of that doodle, uh, can we use machines to sort of push our imagination in directions that uh, wasn't possible before? Uh, so in that sense, uh, can uh, we think of uh, this idea of creating a continuum between humans and the machines where uh, humans are not just uh, using the machines to sort of fulfill some vision of their own, but are allowing for this space uh, between the human and the machine where uh, the humans are also being influenced by the machine to work towards uh, a final output. Uh, so in that sense, a continuum between uh, uh, the human and the machine forms, which is kind of a new uh, art practice in itself. The other interesting thing with uh, data in using that for art is that it allows us to uh, create art from the collective understanding or representation of people. So uh, this will, like I'll show some examples of projects uh, along this thought, but the idea that we can now think of some concept like what does uh, gender look like to people or what is their collective reality of gender, like male and female, and then we can actually go and collect that data and use that data to sort of create a visual, visual representation, a collective visual representation of that. And the last is that uh, we all live in a highly tech immersed world. Uh, a lot of uh, it is AI driven. Uh, so uh, there is no better way to uh, comment on our existence uh, within technology than sort of using that medium to make art with. Uh, so to begin uh, talking about uh, AI art not replacing but augmenting human art, uh, there is some analogy to be drawn from the invention of photography back in the early 1800s. So this is one of the first photographs ever taken. 
And up till then, the artist's uh, responsibility was to, main responsibility was to try and capture reality as best as possible. So to draw people, to draw landscapes, etc. Uh, the artist was judged on how well they were able to capture that reality. But now cameras could do that instantly. So that actually, did that lead to the end of art? Not at all. But that actually sort of liberated the artists uh, to create more abstract things, to create in a way that uh, is more sort of their own personal perspective of, of reality. So, uh, for example, uh, Picasso creating this sort of very interesting representation of uh, a weeping woman is, for example, uh, which is nowhere like a reality representation, but just the artist's interpretation. And our, our photography itself also became an art medium, like fine art photography. Um, and not just something as complex as photography, but even simple technical innovations have led to profound sort of impact on the arts. Uh, for example, just the invention of portable paint tubes resulted in uh, such beautiful impressionist paintings so that artists could go out of their studios to paint like because they had portable paint tubes. Otherwise, uh, they would have to sit in their studio and only paint subject matter like pots and plants, etc. Uh, but now they could travel anywhere. So that sort of indicates that uh, technology always augments or creates new ways of expression rather than inhibit human creativity in any way. Uh, and that is what a lot of my work is about. So uh, one example of that is this art project called a flying pantograph, which is essentially a drawing drone. So uh, there is like this marker attached to the drone. And what it does is uh, it replicates human uh, motion. So if I'm moving my hand on a table, the drone is copying that uh, motion uh, and performing it on a far off canvas. So, uh, uh, for example, the whiteboard in this case. And in some sense, that is augmenting uh, my uh, physical capability. Like it's allowing me to sort of be free from the physical limitations of my body and draw uh, wherever I want. Uh, so that is one sense of augmentation. And uh, uh, that isn't like it is robotic art, but it's not particularly intelligent in any sense. So uh, the, the rest of the talk is more about uh, the works in sort of AI uh, driven art. And uh, just to give some context of why AI has become so popular in the last uh, eight to 10 years uh, is because of two primary reasons. One, there is tons of data available now, like the government is uh, doing surveillance everywhere, there's cameras everywhere, companies are logging all your online data. And so there is obviously incentive in trying to process and make sense of all that data. And uh, for that reason also, like there's been so much research in, in making better compute. So in early 2000, uh, the same processing would cost you a lot, but now it's like just thousand dollars and anyone can buy it off the shelf and so it's become more accessible also uh, and in terms of purely art related with AI this is one of the first triggers at least for me personally that sort of drew me into the space where uh, Google released this project called Google Deep Dream in 2015 and it was the first time that I saw these very strange images like sort of cats and dogs merging into cars and whatnot uh, and then I started to sort of uh, dig deeper into how this thing works and realized uh, how fascinating this is as a, as a concept where what they did was they trained uh, a, a machine learning system to understand the world around it visually. So it could detect like this is a cat, this is a dog, et cetera. And that, that is sort of the perception or classification direction where you're looking at things and understanding what it is. But then what they did, uh, very beautifully is sort of flip that on its head uh, to say that, okay, there is random noise as input. Uh, can the machine uh, change that random noise so that whatever uh, it's creating starts to look a little like dog or a cat and sort of keep moving in that direction uh, and then ultimately produce a cat or a dog. 
Um, so that I think really nicely, at least conceptually captures what cre one uh, idea of creation or creativity can be like, uh, even as kids, we learn to first understand the world around us. And then once we've got that visual experience, we, we start creating from it. Um, so I use this uh, technology of Google Deep Dream to sort of create this tandem uh, art system where uh, you draw something like this uh, feather pen dipped in an ink bottle and then ask the computer to reinterpret that from its uh, visual lens. And then it creates these very interesting outputs where it detects uh, this as a bird and then sort of keeps augmenting that to, to make a bird around it. Uh, and this image we've already discussed. Uh, and this is just uh, a screen capture of tandem in, in progress. Uh, so just random scribbles are interpreted as cars and birds and whatnot. Um, so really forming that continuum between the human and the machine artist. Um, so, yeah, and tandem, uh, I had the opportunity to exhibit at a, at a few places and uh, really interesting to see always sort of people uh, play with uh, machine learning in such an approachable form. Uh, the other uh, AI algorithm that uh, I often use and a lot of AI artists use is, is one called generative adversarial networks. Uh, very quickly to sort of uh, talk about what this does is uh, the idea is can we have a training data set of images, uh, let's say of cats or whatever, of hand-drawn digits, et cetera. And can we somehow train the machine to generate images on its own that look like that training set? So uh, how this works is it has two uh, parts to it. The, the network has two parts. One is called the generator, one is the discriminator. So the generator's task is to make a new image that looks like something from the training data set. And the discriminator's task is to uh, detect if uh, the image that the generator uh, is showing, is it coming from the generator or is that image from the training set itself? So initially the uh, generator's image is easily discriminated as, uh, as a fake image. And uh, because it's initially it's just sort of random noise, uh, but then the uh, generator takes that as feedback and improves its internal uh, uh, mechanism of generation to sort of get better. And the discriminator is also simultaneously training to get better and better. And at some point the discriminator uh, is not able to recognize if the image being shown to it is coming from the training set or the generator. And at that point, the uh, generator is producing images that are uh, very much like the training set, such that the discriminator is failing. So it's a very simple like battle of two networks, and that ultimately produces uh, uh, images like this, like all these faces are, uh, and it's are fake and it's, it was already done in 2017 and both the resolution and the uh, fidelity and sort of the realness of these images has vastly improved uh, already. Um, so I am not particularly interested in sort of creating uh, realistic images. Uh, I'm more interested in the art aspect of it. Uh, so I use GANs in various ways to sort of uh, generate different kinds of imagery. Uh, one of the first pieces that I did with GANs was this project called the Anatomy Lesson of Dr. Algorithm, which is a set of 20 uh, prints. Uh, uh, it was more of a conceptual work where I was drawing inspiration from uh, this painting by Rembrandt called the Anatomy Lesson of Dr. Tull, uh, which was done at a time where uh, people were having this trouble fascination with medical science uh, in 1600s uh, when surgery was starting to happen for the first time. And they were wondering like, should humans be allowed to cut open other humans? Uh, how much uh, of humans should one human be allowed to look into and so, sort of things of that nature. And I feel there is a strong parallel in terms of AI today where people are debating things like should uh, uh, machines be allowed to sort of uh, learn about humans and how much uh, should they learn about humans, etc. So 
uh, what I did was uh, take the machine and train it on surgical human dissections to sort of look at the real core and sort of gore of human uh, in that sense and uh, and bring out these images of human flesh uh, uh, in the from the lens of AI for people to then sort of uh, uh, sort of wonder like to what extent should should we push this AI uh, forward. Um, so yeah, that was more of a provocation piece in that sense. Uh, but uh, this slide I think captures what uh, I feel uh, as an analogy of traditional art to sort of this new AI uh, way of making art where uh, uh, traditionally artists would sort of make their uh, paints and sort of mold, uh, like make their clays uh, uh, and so on. And even like uh, pixels and stuff, uh, they would manipulate those as the raw materials. Uh, whereas today the raw material is data. Um, and uh, you manipulate data to sort of create art and you manipulate it through uh, tools like your paintbrush, et cetera, earlier. And today you manipulate this raw material of data through AI algorithm. So this uh, I think holds as an analogy between traditional and AI art. And interestingly, like uh, with traditional art, once you've created uh, sort of Paint, you could probably use that uh, in various ways, but uh, with AI art, oftentimes you're creating a new material for each artwork, like you're collecting a new data set or uh, creating a new data set, etc. And one project that really sort of uh, shows an example of this analogy is this work called Strange Genders, uh, which I did uh, uh, with this. Uh, other collective of artists called 64 bar one over uh, last year uh, over sort of the lockdown period, et cetera, is uh, the idea that I was representing uh, or talking about earlier of how uh, we can use AI art as a means to show collective reality of a certain topic. So what we did was uh, collected this data set of gender representation of how people in India represent gender. Uh, so we began by physically collecting drawings uh, just before the lockdowns in March. Uh, we were going to people and asking them to draw uh, their idea of a standing male and a standing female form. Um, and these are some of the drawings uh, that we collected. And then uh, the second phase of the data collection was done online through Amazon Mechanical Talk. Uh, where we created this simple sort of Amazon mechanical task where people had to draw a standing male and a female form and uh, they were given uh, certain money for doing that. Uh, so we collected about uh, 2,500 to 2,700 images of these two kinds and then uh, trained the GAN uh, algorithm to generate uh, new uh, stick figures or line figures of uh, this gender, of these genders. Uh, so what we also did was uh, use the initial data set that we collected to uh, train a classification network uh, to take some input image and classify it as either female or male with a certain percentage confidence, like 60% female or 80% female, et cetera. So uh, finally, uh, what the whole process of the artwork is looking like is we generated these GAN outputs from the data set that we collected. We passed these AI generated uh, outputs through this classification network to get these kind of figures that you see at the bottom, like 100% female, 80% female, and so on. And then we used these to create this large uh, uh, circular form where the central figure is 100% female, and as it goes outwards in radius, uh, it moves to 0% uh, female at the outermost radius. So this uh, this uh, gender sort of AI generated gender representation drawn from what people of India represent gender like as an artwork. Uh, I think this is uh, interesting to think of from this concept of uh, using AI to sort of create 
uh, visuals that uh, are about a collective reality. Uh, and also being like an Indian artist uh, and uh, working with AI, uh, like mostly if you see AI art or if you Google AI art, like you come across these very European American sort of old masters kind of art uh, works, sort of AI art derived from those kinds of works. And that really uh, made me start feeling like, is, is this going to be sort of the visual representation? What about like the rich Indian art forms that we have? So I started working with uh, mask cultures of India and I uh, started generating these uh, kind of outputs. And masks also, I think, are very interesting conceptually because uh, uh, like masks were used to sort of get into different identities and escape your real identity. And even with AI today and social media and so on, you're always sort of using them as ways to escape your, your true reality and sort of go into these digital avatars and digital realities of yours. So there is that sort of uh, connect in terms of traditional masks and modern masks. Um, so I created different uh, uh, artworks using masks. Uh, one was the sort of 2D works that you saw earlier, but also this interactive work where your face is transformed into this face painting ritual of uh, Southern Kerala dance forms, Thayyam and Kathakali in real time. Um, and uh, One of the sorry, one of the ways of also representing this is uh, to show it uh, as uh, sort of an audience being transformed into these two uh, dance forms, Hayam and Katakali, simultaneously. Uh, so you you realize that you are the art, like in this interactive world. Without you, there is no art. And you realize that you are both sort of a male form and a female form uh, simultaneously. Um, so uh, you sort of start associating yourself with multiple identities. And what is also uh, another reason for having this uh, sort of uh, showing the Thayyam and Kathakali side by side is traditionally Thayyam is, is a dance form of uh, sort of the lower caste people and Kathakali was a dance form where only the higher caste people were allowed to see and it wasn't performed in religious places and so on. And now with, with the use of AI or technology, you are breaking those boundaries apart and everyone is sort of everything. Everyone can be both these forms simultaneously almost. So that is also a comment on using technology in a positive way of uh, breaking sort of boundaries of of identity. Um, and yeah, last uh, piece of the talk is about tech art uh, being a commentary on our existence with it. So for that, uh, like one work that I did uh, is called Authorize, which is essentially a writing machine. So someone walks up to this and starts writing something like this person wrote human is, but then all of a sudden uh, the machine starts taking control of the human hand. So now the person is just holding the pen and the machine is moving their hand to write something uh, based on, on a magnetic uh, system under the table. Uh, so what happens is essentially like this idea that uh, when you are interacting with technology today, especially with AI built into almost all technologies, uh, can uh, you, like you you sort of lose agency or control at some point of time and the ai is sort of manipulating your decisions and activities and you sometimes don't realize that so with authorize you make that very uh, sort of extreme by taking physical control of the person to try and get people to think more deeply about what their relation with uh, technology and interacting with technology is and this is like just a uh, to give a sense of what the back end of authorize is. So someone starts writing something, uh, there is a system to recognize what they're writing. And that becomes the starting text for an AI text generating system called LSTM. Um, and that AI text output is then uh, 
like that AI text output is generated by a, a model trained on philosophy books uh, that I got from the Gutenberg project. And uh, that AI generated text is converted to handwriting again on, on the LS, using the LSTM algorithm. Uh, using a pre-trained model of human handwriting, and that is used to move this magnet uh, to write uh, essentially through the human hand uh, outputs like this. Uh, and AI art is being recognized as a new genre of art internationally. Uh, there have been auctions done both by Sotheby's and Christie's uh, on it, and uh, the last bit is sort of talking about NFTs, which is the idea of putting art on blockchain and making digital art uh, tamper proof uh, and its history track sort of in terms of ownership and ensuring secondary sales are also uh, ensured because now the transaction from one person to other is, is transparent. And one of the platforms that I work with is called Super Rare, where I put up these NFT artworks. Um, um yeah and there are other platforms for that also uh, but it, it does come with an ecological cost so there is currently a lot of debate uh, in terms of uh, is nfts sustainable and there is sort of uh, ethereum 2.0 that's coming in which is supposed to be much more sustainable and there are already some alternate blockchains that uh, have uh, lesser sort of uh, energy requirements. So there is all kinds of things happening in that space. It's very early days. So uh, lots of activity. Uh, feel free to sort of check that out also. Uh, and lastly, I'll leave with this, uh, this question of is the computer originally, is, does it create original art? And so uh, in some sense, the humans also just create something that they've been taught to or they've looked at or through their experience. And if the machine is given enough experience, then maybe what it creates is also sort of uh, similar to how humans create. I don't know. I'm not commenting on AI computers, original artists or not, but just sort of food for thought. Uh, thank you.